Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership Impact Webinar Series. My name is Dan Horgan, Senior Director of Corporate Engagement for Mentor. We're so excited that you're able to join us today for Engaging Young Men of Color and Conversations on Masculinity. We have an amazing group of speakers and panelists today uh, getting ready to deliver the content. Before we jump in, I just want to cover a quick uh, list of some logistical items. First and foremost, I just want to say that today's session will be recorded. Uh, within 24 hours of today's session, you'll receive an email from us that includes the recording of the session in case you want to listen to it again. It will also include the slides uh, from today's session, along with a one-pager that gives some tips and recommendations for mentoring programs to consider in the advancement of these conversations on masculinity with youth within your program. Uh, if you don't by any chance get that uh, email within the next 24 hours, simply email us back the invite that was sent out initially, and we'll make sure that you get copies of all those things. In order to maintain the best sound quality throughout today's session, we will be muting everybody who's joining as a participant. And we do encourage you, though, to participate in terms of questions that you might have or comments that you want to share. Throughout today's session, I'll be moderating the chat box and the question box, which are located on the right side of your screen. So again, feel free to submit any questions, any comments as the speakers are sharing the information. And I'll leave plenty of time at the end uh, for some Q&A run out of time for any reason and we don't get to your question specifically, I will follow up and include that within the notes from today's session as well. So with that, we're gonna jump right in uh, and I'm gonna ask our group of panelists and speakers uh, to do a quick round of introductions. So we're gonna ask them to do a quick 60 second or less uh, overview and introduction before we jump into the, the main content. Daddy, I'm gonna ask you to kick us off from Mentor. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming and joining us today. My name is Denny Silla, and I'm a program manager at Mentor at the National Mentoring Partnership. And in my role on the program team, I support the development of projects and trainings to support adults and everyday adults around how to build positive relationships for young people. And so I'm really excited today to be a part of this project where we get to talk about masculinity and gender identity and how to create safe spaces for adults and young people to engage in these conversations and strengthen their relationships with each other. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Dudney. Hilda, I'll toss it over to you. Hi, I'm Hilda Marie, and I'm the Program Director for Vibrant. Our organization partners with a fellowship initiative to provide emotional wellness assessments, uh, identify emerging mental health needs or concerns, and address mental health crises and refer the young men in the program to the appropriate services and providers. Great, thanks, Hilda. Rod, can I toss it over to you? Sure, um, first of all, I just noticed there's two Ds on my name, Rod, there's only actually one, uh, in case you're wondering. Um, I'm um, delighted to be here. I'm uh, partnering with uh, uh, Hilda uh, and Vibrant, uh, but I'm also at my own company, Action Research Associates. And um, I'm a professor emeritus in psychology at the Graduate Center at City University of New York. And I've been doing research and programming um, uh, with uh, young men of color uh, with a specialty on uh, young African-American men in the high school age range and above. Interested in their own personal development, uh, but also their um, development politically. So I look at the social political development of young people. And... Um, I've been working more recently with a, a number of mentoring groups, so, so I'm delighted to be here. And, and like Hilda, I'm a, a um, mental health professional. I'm a, a, a clinical psychologist. Thanks, Rod. Rudy, I'm going to toss it over to you for your introduction. Good afternoon. My name is Rudy Lozano. I get to lead the work uh, for the Fellowship Initiative in Chicago, which is a program uh, that's part of J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'll talk more about TFI later. Glad to be here with you all. Thanks, Rudy. Also from TFI, Fernando. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fernando Lorenze. Uh, I am Rudy Lozano's counterpart, his colleague in New York, so I have the opportunity to lead the Fellowship Initiative, a college and career readiness program for young men of color in New York. And as Rudy said, we'll uh, talk more in detail about that later. Happy to be on the call with everyone. Thanks, Fernando. And Brendan, take us home. Hello, um, everyone. My name is Brendan Aleman. I am a TFI alum. I'm currently an Overland College uh, student. I'm on my second year here. 
Excellent. Thanks, Brendan. As we jump into today's session, I just wanted to spend a minute or two, if we've got anyone joining us who's not familiar with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, just wanted to give you, again, a quick overview, and you'll be able to review these slides and the content we send out afterwards. So Mentor has been around for over 26 years, and our work really is organized, I would say, into three main areas of focus. The first is really driving awareness around the overall mentoring movement, and specifically the need and impact of mentoring on young people across the country. We provide training and technical assistance that is both research-based as well as practitioner-approved to ensure that programs of all different sizes and all different focus areas within the mentoring space have the support they need to align to the elements of effective practice in youth mentoring. And we also spend a lot of our time doing advocacy and research work so that we can continue to increase the overall investments and engagement within the mentoring movement both with young people as well as with mentors representing a variety of different uh, backgrounds and pathways leading to the mentoring relationships. We certainly uh, don't do this work alone. Across the country, we support over 2,000 mentoring programs of all different sizes and all different areas of focus. So anything from STEM-focused mentoring to sports-based mentoring, informal mentoring and formal mentoring, one-on-one -on -one and group-based. These programs leverage the resources that Mentor National, as well as our affiliate network across the country, representing states and regions uh, that they provide to them uh, at the local level. In addition to all of our programmatic partners and our affiliate partners across the country, we also work in partnership with a variety of corporations and foundations to further advance the overall movement. And I just wanna give a shout out, our main partner for today's session is J.P. Morgan Chase. You'll have an opportunity to hear in a second uh, their signature mentoring program called the Fellowship Initiative uh, and really dig into a lot of the support that they provide, not only through their own mentoring initiative, but to the broader mentoring field, which is what this masculinity guide is a tool for all mentoring programs, for all individual mentors to be able to leverage. And for that, we certainly uh, are grateful. We know the need for mentoring based on the research that Mentor has done and specifically going out and asking young people, what is the impact of mentoring? One in three young people are growing up in America without access to a caring adult outside of their immediate family. And our ultimate goal is to not only close that gap, but to continue to expand the web of support for young people so that they have the support they need to be successful at school, at work, and in life in general. The young people specifically said in the mentoring effect research we did a few years ago, that it not only helps them prepare for academic success, it also drives their engagement in their communities as volunteers and as leaders of school-based organizations and community-based organizations alike. My favorite statistic coming out of the mentoring effect was the fact that 90% of the respondents said that they, who had a mentor, said that they are now interested in becoming mentors themselves. And I point to that statistic just because it can show the ripple effect that if we invest and engage within the mentoring movement and ensuring that young people have a web of support around them, where they can thrive. It'll have a rippling effect in terms of the role that they play in mentoring other young people within their communities and across the country. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Fernando and Rudy, who are gonna set us up with some context around the fellowship initiative and really give us the why behind the Masculinity Guides creation. Fernando, I'll toss it over to you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, Rudy and I are going to, uh, as you just mentioned, um, pull together uh, our programmatic, the programmatic elements in the fellowship initiative and the partnerships that we've put together. And I believe Rudy's going to lead us off uh, by talking a little bit about uh, how the guide came to be with regards to the partnership. So, Rudy, back to you. Thank you, Fernando, and thank you, Dan. Uh, we are thrilled to be here with you and our wonderful colleagues from Mentor and Vibrant. I just want to do a general TFI overview. J.P. Morgan Chase uh, created TFI in 2010 as a pilot program in New York City to expand economic opportunities for young men of color. Uh, the program was born out of our interest in the educational and employment outcomes for young people, and we wanted to accelerate that progress for young men of color specifically. Uh, it was also a new and unique approach uh, for the firm because we wanted to do more than just write a check. We wanted to invest our time, expertise, and our greatest resource, our employees, to make a real difference. Since that pilot in New York City, we have actually expanded uh, TFI to Chicago, Dallas, and Los Angeles. Um, if you want to uh, roll the slide, that'd be great. Um, 
and over 350 employees have volunteered for TFI primarily uh, as mentors, making a three-year commitment to the fellows. Um, as you can see from the slide and, and what was mentioned already from Dan, um, there are several challenges facing our young men of color in this country. Um, and you can look at the statistics, I won't read them. Um, and if you wanna move on to the next slide as well. So uh, TFI focuses uh, on students from uh, economically distressed communities. Uh, we work uh, in those communities specifically to prepare our young men uh, for to graduate high school, prepare them for college, and then obviously for a career after uh, uh, post-secondary and college. Um, if you wanna keep moving the slide along. Uh, and here are some statistics on the uh, growth of our program starting in 2010, expanding again in 2014 uh, to the cities that I mentioned. And we currently have a class of 200 students participating. They're all juniors in high school. Uh, and as I already mentioned, we have over 350 employees uh, that have participated as mentors. And if you could move the slide again. Uh, there are three uh, main areas that we focus on uh, as tenets uh, of, our, of our model. Uh, high touch, so we meet three Saturdays a month over three years. Uh, this is a cohort model, so in each city we have either 40 students or 60 students participating. Uh, we focus on academics, we focus on uh, leadership development, we also work with families to prepare the families uh, for the college uh, going experience, and then we as well partner with quality partners in our respective cities to bring uh, those skills to our to our fellows. If you wanna continue. And here are uh, some of the uh, elements that I've mentioned already, but I'll, I'll repeat them. Uh, academics, uh, something we will focus on every single Saturday. Mentoring is definitely a uh, component of our program and mentors are JP Morgan Chase employees that uh, volunteer their time over a three year period. Uh, we are just wrapping up um, our SAT and ACT prep classes uh, for our fellows for this semester, um, leadership, and then the social support and networks. And I'll just highlight uh, one of the factors, um, which is we provide uh, counseling and therapy to all of our fellows and even some family members that are in need um, as we come to know our fellows and understand what their needs are in the social emotional uh, space, if you wanna continue. So I'll just uh, say one last thing before handing it over to Fernando. In terms of the guide, how we came to um, thinking about this guide for today, the initial idea came out of reflections from our team and national conversations about equity and the, the advancement of women or for women. Uh, we wanted to understand how the fellows were thinking about these issues. And we felt as a global leadership program, we had an obligation to work with them and, and teach them to be champions for women and other people who may be experiencing challenges in their community. At the same time, several mentors were sharing that they weren't always comfortable having these conversations about equity, gender, and relationships with our fellows. So when we discussed this with Mentor and Vibrant, it became clear that this would be a great resource for the field. Um, and with that, I'd like to transition this back to my colleague, Fernando, uh, who, has, as he mentioned, uh, leads the work for TFI in New York City. Fernando, it's all yours. Uh, thanks, Rudy. That was a, uh, a really helpful overview of the uh, program, our program, as well as the how this uh, guide came to be. Rudy uh, finished up by mentioning um, some of the supports uh, that TFI provides. And I just want to uh, reiterate that the, a lot of these supports are integrated. So when we talk about academic support, one-on-one um, -on -one or group mentoring opportunities, college preparation, leadership preparation, uh, social support network, those are things because we're having or we're providing contiguous programming that we want to, um, we want our participants to experience as integrated. 
Um, and that means that we utilize resources uh, like mentors, employee mentors here at the firm at J.P. Morgan to be able to support um, some of the socio-emotional work that we partner with Vibrant to do. And uh, that also means we're able to draw those mentoring resources support scenarios or college prep scenarios where they can share um, their experiences and give advice on the application process or um, the uses of, uh, of, of um, a specific uh, school or program or degree. Uh, all of that stuff is integrated. And I bring that up because one of the things we're able to do internally uh, within the firm is partner with business resource groups that represent different demographic populations. So we have business resource group for African Americans. We have business resource groups for Latino and Hispanic Americans. We have business resource groups for the LGBTQIA plus community. And all of that allows us to take these kind of basic building blocks of supports and have some of the um, larger conversations that Rudy alluded to about diversity, about identity, uh, about self. And because we use a cohort model, we're looking to utilize the group, the dynamic of our groups in each of the four cities that JP Fellowship Initiative is located in to help support that. So we, of course, want to provide and create and support a safe space. Um, and you'll hear more about uh, how our partners support us in doing that. But um, in accomplishing that, that means we need to have those open conversations that Rudy uh, alluded to about um, identity, about uh, race, about gender, about sexuality, and um, those business resource groups that I mentioned can be incredibly powerful partners uh, because you're bringing in adults um, who are invested in diversity, invested in a professional setting to have conversations with young men and to talk about some of the challenges that they see and some of the things that they're working on. Um, for instance, uh, we knew that we needed to provide greater support in the New York cohort around having conversations about um, diverse um, identities and gender, diverse identities and sexuality. And we reached out to our um, business resource group uh, that supports, called Pride, that supports the LGBTQIA community here, to facilitate some of those conversations and talk through some of those um, scenarios and you and we also are lucky to have um, vibrant uh, on the call with us as well who helped us work through some issues that we saw early on to continue building a, a foundation of uh, brotherhood within the cohort that we work with so we certainly use those that term we use the term leadership because we're looking to get a lot of our fellows to work on not just being um, aware uh, not just being, not just understanding what these terms mean, what diversity means to them, to the community, to uh, our society, but also to be leaders, allies and leaders in a space where we're um, working to develop uh, a social strata where we're um, more understanding of one another, one that's uh, healthier. And so that includes teaching and uh, providing environments where they can learn about that, but also dealing with uh, the fact that they live in this society just like the rest of us, and so they're experiencing um, messages that are contrary to that, you know, and so we are in a position to be able to, with our partners and with um, the the individuals that we work with here, the volunteers at the firm, to address some of those things. And as Rudy pointed out, those are not easy conversations to have, um, but uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, partners that are interested in supporting people coming to a healthier self-concept. Um, so while we have these conversations, we talk about gender norms. Uh, we've raised this a few times. Uh, we realize that young men of color uh, oftentimes have distinct experiences uh, at home and community, certainly within the field, which I think is a demonstrable um, uh, influence over all of us that we need to discuss with them. We need to have conversations about critical thinking, about how to um, delve into how they're represented, how they see themselves and how they see others. Uh, but uh, when you think about it, a lot of those conversations happen naturally and organically. And I think, um, although I'm elaborating on detail, what we really need to be prepared to do as a program is um, not shy away from those conversations, not shy away from those topics when the fellows bring those to us. And uh, those have been, I think, particularly productive opportunities for us to drive uh, messaging and to, and to be open to their experiences and to allow them to, together, 
um, uh, build a, a much better sense of how to, how to communicate and how to express differences. Uh, I want to uh, thank you guys for for listening to Rudy and myself, and um, thank you all for joining us today. This has been a great opportunity, and I'll throw it back to Dan. Thanks, Fernando. And thanks, Rudy. Uh, so as we jump into the the sort of core understanding of what this masculinity guide is all about, I just want to, before I turn it over to Dudney, just give everyone context on the call. So today's session is really the lead up to the release of a guide on helping mentoring programs and mentors and mentees engage in conversations around masculinity. And so Dudney was our lead writer in partnership with the team at Vibrant, uh, with Hilda's support and leadership, along with Rod from Action Research Associates, and not only Fernando and Rudy, but the entire TFI team, uh, including Linda Rodriguez, who leads up uh, this work in the Global Philanthropy Division of JP Morgan. And so I just wanna say a big thank you to them and let everybody on the call know that you guys are getting the sneak peek, the preview to five of the key recommendations uh, coming out of that guide. Dudney's gonna walk you through those five and then also engage other panelists and speakers on sharing some tangible takeaways or action items that you can apply within your programs and conversations uh, regarding masculinity. So with that, Dudney, I will toss it over to you to kick us off. All right, thank you very much, Dan, and thank you everybody for um, the great context setting for today. Um, you know, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, the conversations around gender identity and masculinity, they're not simple. Um, there can be very complex and complicated conversations, and there's a lot of support that programs will need to provide mentors and mentees, whether in one-to-one -one matches or through group dynamics around these conversations. You know, in the elements of effective pra practice, we talk a lot about monitoring and support as one of our key standards for how you as a program can really set mentors and mentees up for success and really support them throughout the course of the relationship. On this slide, you see a couple of examples here around some of the things that we think about when we have conversations around how do you create an environment where each individual can express their authentic identity while also being able to engage in trusting conversations that allow them to learn and grow and really invest in their growth mindset, especially around conversations like gender identity, which are constantly evolving and informed by so many different messages and so many different cultural norms. And so Rod is gonna go into some specific norms and guidelines and boundaries for programs to think about, but I also want to take this moment to introduce a couple of concepts for all programs to keep in mind. Um, the first is to really begin with the vision and the mission. You know, I think you saw from the introduction by the TFI team how intentional they were about what they wanted to accomplish with the young men in their program. And I think starting with that goal in mind really helps everyone to orient around what kind of environment do we want to create? What kind of young men do we want to become as we develop and grow? The second is to really put in time to define norms and define accountability. Norms around language and communication, norms around participation, the ways in which everyone will be expected to contribute, norms around logistics, um, and norms around conduct are all really, really important in really establishing um, the guidelines that everyone can rally around. And making clear major no-nos and explicit core values um, is also very important. The other piece that we want to establish too is mentors, mentees, and programs all working together to agree on these norms and to establish these norms is very important so that everyone really has buy-in. Um, next, um, defining your terms as well. Sometimes when you have a program that might center around gender identity, there are terms that come up related to kindness or related to brotherhood. And it's really important that whatever terms that you come up with as a program that um, define your norms to really come together to define what those mean, what those look like. And then finally, when there's accountability, after you establish norms and guidelines and boundaries as a group, accountability is rooted on those agreed upon norms. And so when everyone in the group is holding each other accountable, we're referencing back to the norms that we all agreed on, which can be an important part of really helping to make sure the accountability stays strong. And then the last recommendation that I want to put on the table before I toss it to Rod is to keep your set of norms and guidelines to a manageable number. You know, we've seen groups do from three norms to 10, sometimes 12, 
And I think keeping a core group of norms and having a regular practice of referring back to those norms really can help make sure everyone gets reminded consistently about what kind of environment we're trying to have as we navigate these difficult conversations and these programmatic goals together. So I'll stop there and toss it to Rod. Thanks, Stephanie. That's a great um, introduction and big picture of what we're trying to do in establishing a um, culture where these um, challenging discussions can take place. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, nuts and bolts, um, and you should see that on your uh, uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is the right slide. This up now. Uh, these are these are a set of. Um, uh, norms that I've um, collected over the years and um, and modified and 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 thought deeply about um, working with people, both uh, young men and women, um, from ages of high school age to uh, undergraduate work to to graduate work, in dealing with difficult conversations. And um, I think one important thing to realize for the groups that we're working with is that group work is really essential to be able to communicate in a group, uh, to be able to talk to others, to deal with difficult uh, topics, and to uh, do it in a constructive way. And um, specifically, there are two things, and, and both of those were mentioned when uh, Fernando was talking about uh, TFI in general, is critical thinking and emotional development. So when we think about these norms that you see in front of you, both of them involve when you're talking about a discussion when you're having a discussion you're talking about things that involve facts that involve information that involve evidence um, and so we need to help young people to think critically about um, assessing what other people say assessing knowledge um, questioning it being skeptical but doing so in a in a constructive and um, and uh, um, thoughtful way so these things are really aimed at, at dealing with critical thinking, but also the emotional side of things. And and again, as, as Fernando said, these are difficult conversations and Dudney had, had echoed. So I'm gonna go through just a, a few of these things to give you a sense of what we mean here. Um, so you want to you want to emphasize uh, at least one norm that deals with the idea of respect. If there's no other word to remember about the slide, respect is the one to remember because for young men, it's, a, it's an exquisitely uh, uh, important concern from there, from them, and especially in social situations. And realize that often masculinity is something that's performed, especially in a group, and, and young men often feel a need to to uh, uh, express the usual kinds of uh, expressions of masculinity around um, thinking about that you have to score, you have to win, and you have to be tough on points that you make. Um, so. We also need some way to disrupt to disrupt disrespect. So when they hear something that's uh, hurtful to them, that they have a problem with, that you you find a way for uh, to pause the discussion and engage those things. So we've we've used words in the past like a uh, whoa, yo, ouch, rewind, hold up, to, to 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 just go back and make sure we understood what was said and what the intent was, and to be able to work on it. And that's really what happens again in the third bullet point, which is when you don't hear something that you don't like, ask the person to explain it and to work it out. Step forward, step back, um, sharing airtime, and also, uh, especially with young men, getting them to deal with their feelings constructively and to express especially vulnerable feelings. And unless you have uh, these norms that ensure that they're respected and things are dealt with constructively, and people are considering their feelings and not just their thoughts. You're not going to have a, 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 a setting that's both a safe space and a brave space in a sense that young men can take some risks in, in disclosing things about themselves. Last thing I would say, uh, you should consider putting this in a in some visual form. As Dudney said, not too many of them a visual form until they really get this. We've often had young people, uh, not so much in TFI, but in the past, having them uh, actually sign on to they agree with these things. Because cause what you see here are things that I'd like to see in every uh, group. But they may, but there should be a, a, a um, participatory process where you ask them about 
things that is useful for conversation, things that tend to create unproductive arguments and have them generate some of their own. But if they don't generate some of these, I encourage you to bring them up and ask them, do they think that they're important ones to include? So they need to buy into this. They need to see, to see this is important about uh, important to them. And so they'll keep each other, as Dudney said, accountable for these. And with that, I uh, leave it to uh, the next person. All right. And so thank you very much for that, Rod. Um, the second theme that we uh, talk a lot about uh, within the guide and, and our preparation for today is the concept of creating an inclusive culture. And this is also um, one area that takes a lot of intentionality. When we have conversations about masculinity or gender identity, part of the, what makes it so complicated is that these are social constructs that have social roots in, in various concepts, but they also have very cultural and personal roots. And so every young person who comes into the room and every mentor who comes into a room is going to have both commonalities in terms of how they think about these terms, but they're also going to have very individual experiences as it relates to these terms. And so part of what we want to encourage is how do we create an inclusive culture where both adults and young people can come in and have the norm established of trust and respect and be able to participate together in collaborative group experiences. You know, we strongly encourage activities like volunteering, having dialogue circles, having activities where the group can have shared experiences and can practice the norms of listening to different perspectives and different um, ways of feeling and ways of thinking through group engagement. And while that's happening, the role of the program is gonna be really important as it relates to focusing on support and supervision and general monitoring. And so it's really important to establish a clear process for checking in, seeking feedback on how the experience is going, as well as providing tips for both mentors and young people around how to handle problems that may come up through the process of conversations and activities through the group experience. And so, um, you know, creating culture is an ongoing process. And we want to make sure that both young people and adults know that they can all contribute to what it means to be inclusive, but that it's really important that we are here together as uh, what was said earlier to define a way of expressing masculinity and expressing gender identity that is supportive of all genders and all sexes, supportive of women, as well as supportive of a range of ways that masculinity can be expressed and collaborative activities and consistent processes around checking in and gathering feedback and problem solving will really help to establish that culture. I'll toss it here to Fernando and to uh, Hilda for a couple of comments to build off of creating an inclusive culture. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, sorry. Uh, the only thing I was going to, I apologize, Hilda, the only thing I was going to add is um, uh, to emphasize what you um, touched on, which is being able to validate different opinions. One thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say anecdotally that Hilda will probably emphasize is that um, oftentimes you'll have individuals in a group that have uh, passionate opinions about a specific topic or a specific issue of identity, and they're in opposition. And, and establishing the norms that you talked about, Dudney, is critical before and during those conversations so that people know what's acceptable ahead of time and then validating the fact that people are coming at the the issue from different perspectives is really important so that those who may whose opinion may differ um, from what you would accept in your group or from your own opinion still feel as though there's a channel to the facilitators or the program administrators uh, to be able to talk to them so that you're able to influence and perhaps broaden their perspective. So I just wanted to add that, um, and Hilda, I'll throw it to you. Thank you, Fernando. If I had to say what are some of the primary goals of our work of uh, the team at Vibrant, one would be to engage fellows and begin to build trust, and then really encourage the expression of emotions and to bust that myth that men, or young men in particular, and, and young men of color do not have a desire to talk about emotions. And so once we can kind of get past those walls, we're really encouraging help seeking and having these young men ask for the supports they need in order to progress academically, socially, and in all aspects. 
And so I find that there are some critical questions that facilitate discussion in a very safe way and allow young people to disclose a little bit about who they are, what triggers or perhaps boundaries they need in place in their relationship with you, what they need from you. And so these, these questions are meant to really encourage some revelation. And the one question, if I had to take out of this list, the top question that I always encourage at the beginning of all interactions is to ask them one thing about them that is really important that they think I should absolutely know. And I have found that this often leads to more questions and greater discussion. And I start to get to know that young person. And so I'll share two brief examples of how that question was incredibly productive. Uh, with one young man, the answer to that question was, I don't trust people. And so he gave me an in incredible amount of information almost immediately. And so that led to other questions. Well, tell me more about that. How did that come about? Who do you trust? Uh, and as we talked and talked, he came to his own conclusion that it wasn't that he didn't trust people. It was that he didn't trust his own instincts about who to trust. And that was a huge re revelation for that young person. Uh, just this weekend, I had a conversation with another young man who shared that, in his words, I am an introvert initially. But if I like you and I trust you, you'll see that I'm going to become an extrovert. Uh, and so I really could follow in the conversation when that shift occurred, when he kind of went from being guarded and reserved to really starting to open up or laugh or be sort of more interactive. Another question that I think is critical just to ask about core values. I find that when conflicts occur among young people and amongst all people, usually a core value has been violated. And so just knowing what that is gives us some guidelines for how to interact with that young person. And knowing what their triggers are and what might set them off is also critical for their self-awareness, but also for our awareness of where we need to tread carefully. And if anything, if all these questions fail and you don't get a response initially, I say persevere, but ask how can I best support you? And that will usually give you some guidelines about where they want you to be at that moment in their lives and then leave that door open uh, because I'm, I'm certain that once you've established this connection, they will come through that door at some point. This is the, thank you very much, um, both Fernando and Hilda for that. And this is the third um, core message that we want to share which is really around how to engage youth proactively. You know, one of the things that we've learned from our work at Mentor and, and our collaboration with our partners here on this project is how incredibly valuable and important it is to really honor and pay attention to the ways in which young people themselves are sources of allyship and support for each other, as well as important sources for feedback for programs. You know, young people really want to be able to share their stories and perspectives. And those stories and perspectives are essential to conversations around masculinity and gender identity, as well as other difficult conversations. And young people really want to have an environment where um, individuals, programs, adults, really listen to understand rather than just to respond. Let youth tell their own story using their own words and work with that to create a common experience around how to improve the program and provide a space for dialogue. And so providing or prioritizing youth voice and agency from the beginning of programming becomes really, really essential. So from recruiting to the kickoff of your programs to the conclusion of your program, really letting young people know that their perspective matters all the way through makes it a much safer environment for when difficult conversations do happen. Um, one of the things that we encourage with a topic like masculinity is it's important to establish the norms in the collaborative environment from the outset so that when conversations like that happen, there's already a culture of being able to share your story. There's already a culture of collaboration, and it makes it a little bit easier to be vulnerable and to share of yourself and to share of your story when that's been the norm and you've been seen throughout the program versus simply at that moment. And so this idea of engaging the way young people can be leaders, can engage in fellowship, as well as can be active followers, um, following the lead of each other is a really important part of the process. And so I'll talk to, to Fernando now, who's gonna go into a little bit more around how you can plan your engagement activities with that goal of building the trust needed 
to help young people feel that they're an essential part of the process. Dudney, thank you so much. Um, I think a lot of what um, is most critical has been touched on um, by the panel, but I just want to reiterate the importance of what Hilda and Rod both mentioned, creating trust, uh, building credibility with any individual that we intend to mentor, any relationship we intend to build, um, all activities that we create. Um, for uh, a mentoring relationship, if it's hanging out with a young person, um, getting on the phone with them, uh, uh, getting lunch with them, all of that should be done not just with the transactional goal of uh, spending the time or uh, making sure we, we get the volunteer time in, but thinking critically about how, wh what does this opportunity allow me to, how much trust does it allow me to build? How much credibility can I create by showing interest in uh, this younger person or this individual um, so they understand that I'm here for them? Uh, so one other thing that I would also point out is creating themes around mentoring, whether it be group mentoring or one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I think if we're giving ourselves a platform or an idea, a goal in mind, it makes it a lot easier to begin to stick to that goal as we speak, meet with, uh, provide programming for an individual or individuals repeatedly so that they are hearing the same message. They begin to understand um, how we value the experience so uh, some of what I'm uh, referring to, themes of mentoring uh, relationships, things that should flow from mutual respect. Uh, examples are establishing an underlying principle or set of values. Now uh, that can give your mentoring context. So for instance, um, what if you and the mentee or program participants knew that personal growth, becoming better people, self-development were, were the overall goals with a reason, with a purpose behind the effort to get to know each other and push each other? Uh, what if they understood fellowship um, as the underlying goal, was creating a network, trusting each other, having brothers and or sisters? Um, or what if there was a, a longitudinal endeavor, even, even something that seems a little bit more transactional, like getting to college, completing college having that as a as a, a goal can be a tremendously focusing um, principle to use to say look I'm trying to help you or we're trying to help each other when we form this uh, this group identity a couple last things um, uh, and then I'll throw it back to Dudney some examples that we use um, uh, legacy connections uh, involving some of the more senior or older fellows in our program, those who are in college, those who may have graduated college, in recruiting, screening, or interviewing uh, young men that we bring into the new cohort so that these individuals are interacting with each other, those that are younger are looking at those who've completed the program and, uh, and pulling it back, uh, working to build communication uh, intergenerationally between these uh, cohorts so that they're um, talking to each other. In particular, we want to make sure that uh, fellows are um, and who are in college are talking to high school fellows about what the college experience is like so that they begin to see themselves there. Uh, lastly, we employ selective competitive team building uh, by creating project teams that we call squads. Our fellows are given space to develop Entities by naming their squads and creating communication norms for their squads. Um, program communication is filtered through these groups so that they uh, bear a certain amount of responsibility for communicating with each other uh, what what the expectations are in completing projects, and this helps build uh, accountability within the group. So those are just some examples, and I'll throw it back to Dudney. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and this next one um, around engaging and expanding networks um, is something that, um, you know, like Dan said at the outset around really thinking about how we can engage the web of support around young people. Family, culture, community are really important entities that shape gender identity and masculinity norms. And so being able to honor where young people come from is a really important part of the process and individuals around the young person and thinking of ways to engage that group is also very essential because a lot of the messages, a lot of the influences, um, a lot of the ways of thinking and being are influenced by family networks, by culture, and community can extend to informal mentors as well, like coaches or barbers or the young person's boss at a small business. 
And so as a program, thinking about how to engage the broader community that young men operate within and being embedded in those communities and build a relationship with those communities, I think can encourage a communal dialogue around masculinity that will have a major impact on young people um, as they navigate this topic. The last thing I do want to share too is engaged expanding networks doesn't just relate to how you engage with parents and teachers and adults in the young person's life, but it's also recognizing the fact that young people, as they come into the room, they have share stories of their own that they share, but there are so many stories and voices of the people in their lives that have shaped them. And so how do we create a room where young people can come and reflect about the relationships they have with the different people in their lives? Can they come into this room and think about what is my relationship with the woman in my life? What is my relationship with the men in my life? Have I had relationships with individuals of diverse gender and sexual identities? And what do those things mean? And giving um, young people uh, the space to really reflect on what their network is and isn't and how that may have influenced their beliefs and their practices around masculinity and gender identity is also a very important part of the process. So engage that broader community and create a space where young men can reflect on their network and how they've been influenced and shaped in terms of lessons and norms around this topic as well. I think I'm gonna to toss it now to Rudy and Hilda who go uh, deeper into the reasons why engaging parents and families are an essential part of this process. Would you like well, to go first? Would you like to go for yes, it? Yes, uh, thank you, Rudy. Uh, in the interest of time, I just want to say that sometimes when we're working with youth and adults, parents, mentors, uh, and other providers that service youth, we tend to separate activities. And what we've been finding just sort of by experimenting, particularly in New York uh, with Fernando's group where we had mentors pair up with fellows in conversations around masculinity, and in Chicago where we had parents pair up in a workshop with youth in conversations about communication, is that we really open up a space to understand that there are some differences and sensitize each other to what uh, the, the other side needs, uh, but also that there are a lot of commonalities, and those are usually needs and, and things that uh, they're, they're seeking from each other but perhaps not communicating. And so with the community guidelines that we've discussed, in place, these conversations have actually been much more productive than conducting separate activities for, for each population. So we really encourage that, and, and I believe Rudy has a bit more to say on that as well. Well, in the interest of time, uh, I'm happy to move on to the next uh, topic, if that's okay. Yes, and so very quickly here, this is just to share one of the uh, last pieces of feedback around how to leverage um, pop culture. And the reason why we talk about this is a lot of influences that we have um, in our lives around gender identity and masculinity are also defined by our social context. And so the media, public figures, um, diverse forms of media all can influence our perceptions around what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine, um, can influence um, the system that exists around sexism and homophobia. And so making space to engage the impact of culture is also an important part of the process. And I'll toss it to Rod to close us out before we move to the next section. Uh, thanks, Dudney. Um, we've really discussed a number of important things that are interpersonal, group, organizational, that uh, help uh, young young men think about this issue of masculinity. So it makes sense that we um, sort of end about the, what we call the dominant narrative, this, uh, the, all the messages they get from pop culture, from um, presidents, um, from all kinds of folks who can influence their notion of what uh, uh, masculinity is. And so the good part about that is if you want to meet them where they are after you've gotten a chance to learn what their interests are, what movies they like, what kind of music they like, what they watch uh, on television, you can uh, do a little bit of a um, co-viewing, if you will, with them. Uh, I was thinking about, for example, the uh, Black Panther movie. You have an example of, actually, as, as these superheroes go, a pretty progressive notion 
of masculinity where you have a sort of two main characters, one being um, uh, T'Challa and the other being um, Killmonger, who are very different. Killmonger at first glance is, is pure um, toxic masculinity, but if you've seen the movie, you realize it's a bit more complicated than that. But certainly when you look at T'Challa, his relationships with um, uh, women uh, in his life, uh, his mother and his sister in particular, you realize that he represents uh, a notion of masculine strength, but not solving problems that harm others unless absolutely necessary. And sparing, for example, the, the, the person who challenged him to, uh, to uh, his uh, heading of, uh, uh, of the nation. So what you see on this slide is thinking about as you, as you watch and share experiences with your mentee, to think about, ask them some questions about it. Um, don't so much judge things you don't like, you might have to bite your tongue in some ways, but ask about what do you think about that, that he spared, T'Challa spared this guy who, who would have killed him if, if he would have had the chance. But you can, you can formulate a lot of the questions that you see here in your own words to explore emotions and sentiments, to explore how they make sense of what they see, their observations, why they feel that way, get into the uh, uh, emotional part is especially important for young men. And ask them about, you know, in discussion after the movie, well, when he did this, could, can you imagine what you would have done or would you have done something differently? And make it conversational. Um, give them a chance to express themselves, uh, share in your own. But I think this is really important back to this issue of critical thinking about masculinity and the dominant uh, messages they're getting. So they think critically, it's, yes, it's entertainment, but some of this stuff can leak in into your, to where you think about um, uh, being a man. And, and you want to make sure that you have some control over the kinds of uh, masculine attitudes and traits that you think are, are to be part of yours and those that you reject. And to an extent even that you want to hang your hat on this identity of masculinity as a core part of who you are, as opposed to being an adult or being a person. So I think this is really important, and, and the world uh, of pop culture provides a number of opportunities to engage them in, in informal discussions about them and get an understanding of uh, how they see things and, um, and give them a chance to think and reflect on them. So with that, I'll end uh, this portion. Thanks so much, Rod. Uh, so this is Dan. I'm going to ask Rudy and Brendan to close us out for today's session. And just a couple of key things. So Brendan and Rudy have um, some great tips, especially focused on how do we prepare mentors for discussions on masculinity, both formal mentors and informal mentors. I know there were some questions around that in the chat box. So Rudy and Brendan, I'll let you guys take us home as we wrap up today's session. Thank you, Dan. Are you there, Brendan? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. So I just wanted to ask you a couple questions um, and just a reminder to all the all our listeners. Uh, Brendan uh, is a TFI alum, meaning he has graduated from the high school component of the fellowship initiative and now is a sophomore at Oberlin uh, College um, and, and is from Chicago. Uh, so Brendan, can you describe a situation uh, or um, uh, yeah, a situation you were dealing with uh, back when you were in high school and uh, and tell us you know how you dealt with it, uh, knowing that you had a, a group of peers uh, and and brothers around you uh, to to hear you out. Uh, yeah, um, I think the main one that I think always comes to mind is uh, when my father was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, stage four cancer. Um, and I just remember it being like a Friday. And I was actually on my way to see my TFI mentor. And I had just gotten the call from my mom. And she had told me that my father was um, in the hospital. And I hadn't seen him for about a day. So he was in the hospital for a while. And then she finally just told us. Um, and so I immediately told my mentor, like, oh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to meet you. Um, and he was like, it's OK. Like, we can talk later if you want to talk more. And he like gave me a call later. And we talked some stuff out. Um, and just like help me process that. But um, I think what I got the most out of that conversation was like how crucial TFI was for me. Cause um, I was in this mindset, like I didn't want to do anything. Like I didn't want to be around anyone. Um, but my mentor was, no, Brendan, like that's not you. You love TFI, like you like going, 
like just go and and um maybe that would uh distract you and i was like okay fine and so i ended up going to tier five but i wasn't my usual self um and i think a lot of the fellows picked up on that and like um our teaching staff on there um also kind of noticed um I remember henry asked me um he was the english teacher there uh, at the time and he was asking me like what's wrong like do you want to talk and i was like no i'm okay like i'm okay and the fellows were the same thing. And then I remember you really actually like the finals uh, at the end of the day almost was where you got up and you kind of gave us the space to talk and say, um, what, what, like, does anyone want to share anything, anything that was good or bad or need something you need help with? Like you can talk it out as a group. And I don't know um, what it was, but I just really felt like I needed just to get it off my chest and kind of put it out there and, and um, internalize it a little bit more than I that I was because I was kind of just brushing it off and um, I remember going up there and I and I choked um, I like cried I started tearing up and I just didn't know what came over me and I was telling the fellows and everyone there like my father's diagnosed he's stage four and I don't really remember who it was but um, one person came up and hugged me and then one person turned to two to three to like 30 and then we were just in this really big group hug um just like crying people were telling me like it's gonna be okay and giving me hugs and like telling me like oh let's go hang out and i'm gonna check on you like tomorrow let me know if you see anything and like how's your mom and i i was just really surprised and in awe and i was still just trying to process everything um but yeah that's one of the the moments that i think i had um in high school at tfi Thank you for sharing that, Brendan. And uh, it was a very powerful moment. And I think, honestly, it was a changing uh, moment within the program because it really solidified the brotherhood and uh, the trust that was in that room that day. Um, so just a quick question. Why why did you share uh, the situation with TFI? What what allowed you to do that? And what were you thinking when when you were sharing this? Um, I think it was a, a lot of things, um, mostly just because, like, I felt that as soon as I came in, um, Rudy, I remember you just telling everyone, like, you was like, hey, man, like, I love you, and, like, walking up to people, so you created this atmosphere of, like, showing emotions, and I remember you would even play some of the DVDs that your dad um, left behind, and we were talking about his legacy, and you'd kind of express yourself, and I've seen that through other people as well, like Akeem, um, I remember so they would come by and kind of check up on me and I had a, like that atmosphere was there was like we care about you and we want to make sure you're okay and even with the fellows too like um, the brotherhood there was pretty strong I think right off the bat everyone was really accepting and um, and my it was like the complete opposite of my high school my high school like I didn't feel like I had anyone who I can really talk to um, I just kind of felt like an outsider there and so it was like the complete opposite and um, I like I said like the brotherhood was real and for me um, and a lot of people were just asking and I was just like I think this is something that needs to be known um, that I'm going through because I didn't know how to process it at the time and I really need to help and um, time after time TFI staff and you know the participants would always show that like they were on my side so I think I was more willing to open up in, in that aspect um, and I did and I was really glad I did um, yeah uh, thank you again for sharing, Brendan, and I, I think uh, your example uh, sharing is really um, uh, really a, an example of, of what masculinity um, looks like uh, in real life. And if you can just close us off with uh, what recommendations do you have for everyone listening, people who are working with uh, young people and young men of color, what recommendations would you have for making sure that there is a space created uh, you know, for people like yourself to express themselves when they're going through tough times? Um, well, a lot of things have already been touched on, but I think the one that I would like to stress the most was the one, um, I can't remember who said it, but it was um, listen, uh, listen to under, was it listen to understand instead of to respond? Um, I definitely agree with that because I feel like ma many times when I was talking to the adults in TFI, like McHenry and Hilda, they weren't trying to um, steer the narrative or tell me how I feel. They were just listening and allowing me to express how I feel. And in that way, I was able to cope with my emotions because I think that if I didn't have those conversations with the, with the adults, uh, I definitely could have gone a different route and I 
could have gotten, um, you know, worse in, in my schools that could have let that affect my studies and so on. But like ha having these conversations definitely kept me on the path of like, this is what I want to do. This is the larger goal. And we're here to support you in any way you can. And I definitely always appreciate that about TFI. Um, so yeah, that's definitely the main one that I would like to stress. Thank you. I just want to say one last thing about Brendan and um, he's a very humble, modest young man, but he is also at Oberlin College because he's a posse uh, finalist and, and uh, earned himself a free ride to Oberlin. So thank you again, Brendan. Thank you. Thanks everybody for jumping in and for participating in today's discussion. As you can see from the content, it's obviously a lot of rich content. We only just really hit on the surface of uh, the great recommendations, the great content, the input uh, that will be featured in the guide. I also just want to highlight and, and thank Brendan, especially at the end, in terms of sharing your story. I think you encapsulated a lot of the recommendations and a lot of the input that others had shared previously uh, throughout today's session. And it's just a perfect example of uh, in order for us to have these engaging conversations around masculinity and creating these cultures of inclusion uh, in communities across America, I think. What's most important is we recognize it as a collaborative process. And just like preparing for today's session, it took, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, who has this amazing mentoring program in the fellowship initiative, the individuals who step up and serve as employee mentors, the young people that step up and apply to be a part of the program and make the commitment, the partners like Vibrant and Action Research Associates and, and Mentor and our affiliates across the country, like it, it takes all of us uh, to support each other. Uh, as we all learn and grow together. And so uh, I hope that you you take some of the advice, you take some of these tips and recommendations forward and apply them to your formal mentoring programs as well as your informal relationships. Uh, the formal guide will be out uh, within the next month or so. So we will make sure that everybody who registered for today's session has a copy of the, the completed guide. We'll also again, make sure you have copies of today's slides, uh, the recording of today's sessions, uh, and a one pager that we've created uh, to make sure that in the meantime, while we wait for the guide, <laughs> that you have some of those tips that you can begin immediately uh, implementing. Lastly, I just want to say that Mentor stands as a resource for the mentoring field. There's lots of great tools from webinars to resource guides to the Mentoring Connector, which is our national database of mentoring opportunities that individuals uh, joining us today can leverage. And if you haven't heard about or you haven't attended in the past the National Mentoring Summit, it's a fantastic opportunity to dive deeper into programs like the Fellowship Initiative and hear from partners like Vibrant uh, around the work that they're doing in supporting the overall mentoring movement. So please check out the National Mentoring Summit at mentoring.org. Uh, it's taking place in Washington, D.C. from January 30th through February 1st. And with that, I just want to once again say a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. Uh, and I definitely look forward to everyone who's participated today joining us for our next session. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday season. Take care.